Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's OSA Technical Group webinar, Superconducting Quantum Circuits. My name is Hannah Walter Pylon, and I'll be moderating this webinar on behalf of the Optical Society. We are very excited to have Professor Garcia Ripoll from the Spanish National Research Council joining us for this webinar, which was organized by the OSA Quantum Computing and Communication Technical Group. I want to start today by telling you a bit about our technical groups. OSA technical groups aim to create vibrant and active communities for all of our members to participate in. OSA members offer more than 40 different technical groups to choose from, and each of these groups are led by OSA members who volunteer their time to organize events tailored to your interests, such as today's webinar. In fact, our technical groups have been hosting webinars regularly since 2013, all of which are available for you to view on demand on our website. You can learn more about all of the technical groups, find out about our upcoming events, and access our library of over 100 on-demand webinars by visiting osa.org slash technical groups. Before we begin our presentation, I wanted to note that we'll be addressing your questions at the end of today's webinar. We encourage you to submit questions for our presenter throughout, and you can do so by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You'll then be able to enter your question in the pop-up box. You'll also be able to see questions from your fellow attendees, and if there's one question you really want to see addressed during the Q&A session, you can vote for that by clicking on the thumbs up button under it. At the end of the webinar, we hope you'll take a minute to provide us with your feedback by completing a short survey. You'll also be able to download a PDF copy of today's presentation directly from that survey page. This webinar is being recorded. A link to the recording and the slides will be emailed to you within 48 hours. Now, it is my pleasure to welcome Roberto Leon Montiel from our Quantum Computing and Communication Technical Group. Roberto will tell you a bit more about the group and introduce you to our presenter. Roberto, the floor is all yours. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to our Quantum Computing and Communication Technical Group webinar. Uh, today, we are really excited about the talk of Professor Juan Jose Garcia Ripoll on superconducting quantum circuits. Uh, but before we start, let me tell you a little bit about our technical, uh, technical group. Our executive committee uh, is currently formed by five people. Uh, I am Roberto Leon Montiel, chair of the, of the group. Vito Giovanni Lucivero from the Institute of Photonic Sciences. He is our uh, vice chair. Veronica Vicuña from the University of Naples in, in Italy. He's, uh, she is our webinar officer. Ricardo Telles from CSS in Mexico is our events officer. And uh, Jorge Luis Dominguez from UNAM in Mexico as well is our social media uh, officer. Together, we organize different activities focused on theoretical and experimental aspects of quantum computing, quantum communication systems, cryptography, generation, detection, and applications of non-classical light. And also, we, we focus on quantum measurement and quantum control. So we organize activities around those topics. Our mission or the goal of these activities is to maximize the exchange of information and the creation of networking opportunities for our community. That's our main goal. Uh, and with, uh, with that in mind, we organize webinars, technical events, such as workshops, tutorials, poster sessions, outreach activities. And if you are interested in presenting your research, please uh, contact us at, at this uh, email. And also, if uh, you want to to see more about our group, share experiences or propose new activities, please uh, check our website and also our Facebook uh, page. Now, uh, I would like to, to introduce our speaker today. He's Professor Juan Jose Garcia Ripoll, leader of the Quantum Information and Foundations Group at the Spanish National Research uh, Council and leading expert on quantum computing. He has developed key contributions in the fields of trap ion quantum computing and helped start in the field of quantum simulation with ultra cold atoms. He's the current uh, coordinator of the uh, CSIC, which is the Spanish uh, name for the, uh, for the Spanish National Research Council. Uh, he's the coordinator of the CSIC platform on quantum technologies and the Spanish network of quantum information and quantum technologies. So, so we, 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 we will learn a lot from him today. So, Professor Garcia Ripoll, thank you again for accepting our invitation, and the floor is all yours. Thank you, thank you Roberto. Thank you, Hannah, for the invitation and the presentation. Uh, let me share my screen, if I remember how to do it. No. 
So uh, my goal with this talk was to do a gentle introduction to the philosophy of quantum, quantum circuits, highlighting the overlaps between this field and the field of quantum optics, where other applications of quantum technologies are being developed nowadays. So as, as Roberto said in the introduction, my background is a bit broad. I come from the field of nonlinear optics and applied mathematics for nonlinear Schrodinger equations. And I worked on bosch einstein condensation for a long time, moved through ultra collapsed strapped ions. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is one of the uh, platforms that are a little bit on the macroscopic side compared to, to these other uh, technologies. So superconducting quantum circuits, which are really macroscopic solid devices compared to these uh, uh, isolated atoms and so on, are, are really, really different. But they bring new things into the game of quantum technologies. So the question of, uh, that we have to address first is why, why we want to do things with superconductors. And I would take a few transparencies to give you the main messages that I will try to convey later on. Of course, many of you uh, know about superconducting quantum circuits because of quantum computing, because uh, many companies and many labs are using uh, superconducting circuits to build quantum computers as a platform that is uh, highly scalable with a uh, low decoherence and, and capable of making uh, large operations, like large numbers of operations and many qubits. But that's not the only possibility of the field. So my, my message in this talk is a little bit to offer you somehow other ideas that can be done with superconducting circuits. And I think the underlying idea behind all this is that superconducting circuits are a platform that is very well uh, prepared for doing simulation. Simulation in a sense, in the physical sense, is a, is a way of taking one physical system and use it to imitate some other uh, physical system or to uh, simulate some other problem which is very complex. So what you see in this picture are some uh, work, uh, Hungary works from Gaudí, as an architect from Barcelona. He used to make this kind of uh, funny construct with weights to analyze how actual structures like these cathedrals and so on would behave and whether they would be stable or not. So he was using a simple problem to tackle a more complicated one. And circuits in that in a way, is they are, they are uh, like a universal simulator. They are very good copycats of many physical systems we can do things with them that, uh, that go from simulating uh, in individual systems like photons and qubits to really simulating large systems, many body systems, uh, wage field theories and so on. And then simulators are very special because uh, they allow us to enter new regimes of the physics that we want to explore with these other, these other problems. We can achieve, as I will show you, uh, interaction strengths that are very large, which are uh, larger and stronger than other systems that we could find in nature, like atoms interacting with light. Or, or somehow, because they work at different timescales and different frequencies, we can have very powerful tools for observing phenomena that would be too fast in other systems. And we can see, for instance, as we will see later on, how a, a photon can be emitted or how a photon is, uh, appears out of a, of a quantum system. So, and then the third uh, characteristics of uh, supercon superconductor, which is very, very important, is that essentially superconductor circuits, they are electrical circuits that work in a quantum regime, but they're still microwave circuits. And there are many physical systems that work with microwaves. So in a way, the, the fact that we can develop quantum technology with superconductors enables also the development of other technologies by, by means of building hybrid systems, building interfaces, like for instance, between uh, superconducting circuits and magnetic molecules, like some colleagues of are, are doing in Spain, or between uh, superconducting circuits and surface acoustic waves, like people have been doing in, in Sweden for a long time. So it's a, it's a very broad platform. It's a very interesting uh, uh, set of uh, possibilities. And I want to now explore a little bit how they develop and how, where they come from, give you an intuition and the basic tools that we have in this field. And the title of this talk, although it seems simple, simple it involves many different concepts. So Superconducting quantum circuits means that we want to work with superconductor to create electrical circuits that work in a quantum regime. And that, conveys a lot of information, a lot of constraints and things we have to understand. The history of superconductivity is, is quite old, it's 100 years old. It's, uh, it starts at the beginning of the 20th century with uh, the discovery of machines to, to liquefy helium-4 by Kimberly Holmes. And this guy, as a scientist, decided, that, well, I have this very good fridge, I achieve very low temperatures, what can I do with it? And he tried to put simply materials into that fridge and see how they reacted to these low temperatures. We all know that one of the things he tried is to see how metals behave at low temperatures. And for instance, mercury at a, at a given point uh, became, uh, came from being a conductor with some resistance 
to becoming a material that exhibited no, no resistance at all in the space transition that you he, see here in his original notebook. And this discovery is the seed for a field that uh, revolutionized condensed matter physics and uh, helped us also advance in many other aspects of theoretical many body physics. We have uh, since then discovered many other superconducting materials, from, uh, elementary uh, um, uh, metals like uh, lead or mercury, aluminum, and niobium, and so on, uh, to the ceramic uh, materials that now make uh, high temperature superconductors. This is a really huge two of possible superconducting materials. But if you look at what people call superconducting electronics, it's mostly done with few components that are well known, easy to manipulate, and work at well-defined conditions. For instance, aluminum is a material that can be fabricated very nicely and has good properties and becomes superconductor at one Kelvin. Niobium is better because it has a higher critical temperature and can also be fabricated very nicely. And then there are, of course, uh, these high temperature superconductors, but, but they, they are a little, little bit more difficult to, to fabricate, but they still have some applications in radio frequency. However, we don't want to just do superconducting electronics. As I told you at the beginning, we want to do superconducting quantum circuits. And here comes the key point, and that's something that uh, is underlies all the research at the beginning, of, at the end of the last century, looking for qubits. So what people wanted to do is what it, they wanted to find physical systems where they could explore the quantized nature of, of, uh, of these objects. They could uh, explore quantum mechanics. And for that, the first thing that a scientist has to do is that he has to suppress perturbations. And in particular, he has to eliminate thermal fluctuations. So if we, we take a, a physical system such as an atom, for instance, that we can manipulate with a ultraviolet light, that means that the, the energy uh, scales of this atom, the range of uh, very high frequencies. Uh, these atoms, they can be cooled down to the ground state very efficiently because the, the, the temperature associated to this energy scale is very high. So if I take a, a hydrogen atom uh, at room temperature, it's most likely the electrons are going to be in the ground state. But now we want to do something more challenging. We want to work with uh, electrical circuits and we want to take those circuits to the quantum regime. And because we want to work with a kind of cheap electronics, micro, low energy microwaves, we have to think of frequencies that go up to 20 gigahertz mass, max. And that means we have to work in, a, we have to think about temperatures that go from between 50 millikelvin and one Kelvin. And now we have to compare those uh, effective temperatures to the temperatures of our sample. If the temperature of our sample is very close to this uh, equivalent temperature, then what happens is that our system will have a high probability to be excited. If it's bosonic or fermionic, it can be highly excited when the, uh, the, the effective temperature approaches the energy scales of our system. However, if we can lower the temperature by uh, one order of magnitude, suddenly we suppress the probability of those excitations, and that is what we want to do. We want to take these superconductors and work at temperatures that are well below these effective temperatures for, super, for microwave circuits. So, what you see essentially is that we're going to work in dilution refrigerators, uh, like the ones you see here naked, they, they have a shielding construct around it to, to protect it. These refrigerators, they can uh, go down to very low temperatures, tens of millikelvins, and we're going to build chips uh, with materials that are, again, relatively simple, like aluminum and niobium. And, but once we build this superconducting uh, circuit with superconducting electronics, we still have a lot of questions that have to be addressed, like uh, the size of the system, how many circuits you can put on a chip, how, how they can heat, how we connect it to the outer world, how we measure the signals that, uh, that the circuits create, how we manipulate the quantum states that are in those chips. There are many questions that still uh, are very relevant. It took many years to, to, to solve. But what I find uh, really uh, amazing is that if you think about these temperatures, essentially what we're doing is by going to systems that are way, uh, well, what happened? PowerPoint. Way, way below what we could find if you go away from any physical system that we have here. So the background cosmic radiation is a few kelvins. We are going to have temperatures of tens of many kelvins. It's a very artificial, very unconventional situation, but we know that the physicists have been able to reach these temperatures and even lower. So given that we have this hardware, these superconductors, and that we can build uh, uh, electrical circuits with them, as we know, for instance, from uh, NMR devices and so on. What can we do with them in the quantum regime? What is useful? Uh, what are these circuits useful for? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you elements that we can construct with these circuits, and we will put them together to build a quantum computer at the end. 
So the first obvious thing, and it was uh, well known in uh, the previous century, is that we have the equivalent of light in this circuit. So if you think about uh, manipulating matter and quantum devices, we typically can do it in the visible, infrared, or ultraviolet, ultraviolet regime with lasers. Uh, in superconducting circuits, you're going to have something similar. So what we, we will have is the equivalent of these uh, optical elements like um, fibers, uh, waveguides, photonic crystals, and cavities that do two things. Essentially, on the one hand, they confine light so that we can propagate them, propagate it uh, with uh, very well controlled conditions and perturbed from the environment. And they can also, uh, these structures, these optical structures, they can also trap light into localized modes. So these are like two possible uh, configurations that we can have to, for instance, inject information into a quantum system or to construct a, a, an optical field around a quantum system to manipulate it and probe it. And both things are available in superconducting de devices. We simply have to think up a, a little bit out of the box. It's not going to be this uh, optical infrared or uh, ultraviolet photons. We're going to have microwave photons. And the equivalent of these cavities and, and these uh, waveguides are going to be electrical circuits. The simplest electrical circuit that we can build with this superconductor, I would say it's an LC resonator. It's like the harmonic oscillator of, of uh, one of these quantum circuits, which is made of uh, one uh, inductor, it's a cable with some uh, inductance, and a capacitor. And you see on the right hand side uh, a real picture of, uh, of uh, an LC circuit that was used to interact with the superconducting qubit in an experiment by Paul von Dieth. Mm -hmm. Here you see the, the capacitor is very obvious. And then you have here a cable that has a, a semiconductor here. And when you take the circuit and you analyze it with classical uh, dynamical equations, you find that it is an oscillator with a natural frequency that you can control simply by designing the properly the inductor and the capacitor that form the circuit. So we have a priori the possibility of engineering our uh, microwave uh, photon devices where these photons are confined, these kind of microwave resonators, which will be the cavities that I showed you before. Uh, it's more interesting, however, to be able to inject and extract photons out of a system. And for that, we have a, a different device, which is a waveguide. Uh, here I show you a, a, a coaxial coplanar waveguide, which is made of uh, uh, two ground planes and a central conductor. And here you see a little bit more obvious how these uh, photons are made. Essentially, the photons are plasmonic excitations that move through the surface of these uh, superconducting uh, uh, plates. And they move, and they, uh, when they move, they, they, tra and they travel together with a, a perturbation of the electromagnetic field, which is essentially our photon. So what we do in these devices is simply to allow the photons to propagate. They are no longer confined to this inductor and the capacitor. They can move through the cable, uh, and we can inject these microwave photons, and we can recover on, on the other end. Or we can also take this cable and make a cut here, and make a cut here, and transform the waveguide into a resonator, a multi-mode resonator, uh, similar to the string of a guitar. So you can uh, store a fundamental mode of this uh, cavity, or you can store a high uh, mode excitation, and so on and so forth. And, and the, the, the interesting thing is that now this, this uh, notion of having an electrical circuit with uh, the possibility of confining microwaves uh, brings us to the idea of circuit quantization. The way we, we, we look at these circuits is with effective theories, what we call uh, electrical uh, equivalent circuits. It's a, it's a way of looking at the circuits uh, that uh, uh, microwave engineers uh, develop. But uh, essentially what we do is we uh, write down a circuit with uh, capacitive and inductive elements that imitate, or uh, as, as close as possible, the uh, electrostatic and magnetic energy that is confined in these circuits. In, in particular, for a waveguide, for a, a microwave uh, waveguide like this one, the equivalent circuit would be this uh, series of inductors with some capacitances that uh, you can uh, somehow entreat that uh, it reflects the capacitive energy that is confined between the central conductor and the ground planes. Uh, and these circuits, they can be written down with Kirchhoff equations. And at some point, what we do with these equations is that we uh, assume they're going to be quantized, like uh, uh, Planck postulated that uh, light, uh, well, uh, Einstein postulated that light will be composed of uh, quantized particles. But we're going to say is that at some point, at very low temperatures, this uh, Microwave excitations that move through this uh, equivalent circuit are going to be quantized, and we have to treat them with a quantum mechanical theory. 
It's interesting, however, to look at these circuits because they are not the only possibility. These are two-dimensional circuits, but microwaves can be conducted in many ways. If you open your microwave oven at home, it's not going to look like this chip. You are going to have something like tubes like this one. So you also have other possibilities of building microwave Wi-Fi and microwave cavities, like having these uh, copper tubes where you can inject a microwave and it can propagate through the tube similarly. Here it's even more obvious that the equivalent circuit description is really an analog because, I mean, this is a three-dimensional structure. It has, it has little resemblance with this and, and to analyze properly these structures, you really need uh, sophisticated software uh, to, to study how these microwaves uh, behave and propagate. But once you have this uh, uh, electrical picture, but what you can do then is, as I said, quantize it. And, and this is what uh, we physicists use to describe a quantized electromagnetic field. We have some uh, collection of frequencies that are the normal modes of our wavelength or our tube or whatever device that we have to confine the, or propagate the, the microwaves. And we have a number of excitations that we will have in each possible mode. And of course, we have the waves associated to those modes. It's not very different from the, the way we could analyze, for instance, an optical fiber. It's simply just a different set of energy scales. And of course, as I told you before, once we know the frequencies, we know the temperatures that we would have to bring the circuit down. Uh, and we, we can know how many photons, how many thermal photons are in each of the modes of our sample. That's something that we have to understand very well to see whether there is going to be the coherence or perturbations in these systems. But from that point of view, the fact is that these photons are very well behaved. These uh, microwave guides are, are, have little losses, have little uh, decoherence. So they are, they are the most stable component in the superconducting world. Uh, but then, so I, I have shown you that we can somehow simulate ladder, um, light in the spirit that I told you before, that superconducting sequences are really good simulators. But we can also simulate matter. So we can go uh, look for qubits, it's essentially uh, like uh, the atoms of uh, the artificial atoms of our electrical circuit world. Uh, what we're going to look for is for discrete uh, few level systems, for instance, two level systems that we can now prepare in pure states or superpositions of them, and we can use them now, as we know, to build quantum computers. But the question is how can we go from these uh, uh, oscillators to something that resembles more like a, an atom? Uh, and the answer is uh, given by this haiku from John Pesky. He put it out a uh, few days ago in Twitter. By the way, Quantum Twitter is, is a very nice place to hang out if you are bored. You, you learn a lot by reading all these uh, tweets. Uh, and his answer is, okay, hey, resonator, you want to be a qubit, you have to be nonlinear. Essentially, what we have to take is uh, uh, grab those circuits, those oscillators, those LC resonators I showed you before, and we have to break the, the harmonic spectrum. And the reason is very simple. Uh, suppose I take this uh, um, harmonic modes that I showed you before that are confined in this uh, cable because it is cut. We have at least one fundamental mode. Now, the energy spectrum of this oscillator, of this resonator, is going to may, may be made by uh, discrete energy levels separated always by the same energy, which is essentially the quantum of energy associated to this microwave mode. If I take the equivalent of my laser, which is going to be a microwave generator, and I inject energy into this circuit and I excite it, what's going to happen is that if my system was originally in the ground state because the temperature was very low, it's going to get excited with some probability to the, to the first excited state, it's going to acquire one photon, but it can also acquire two photons, three photons, four photons, and so on. So there's nothing to stop it because the separation uh, between energy levels is always the same, it's the quantum of, uh, of energy, H bar omega. So if we want to create uh, what would be an artificial atom, something which has only a few levels, like zero and one, that can be a good qubit, uh, what we have to do is we have to break this chain. So we have to introduce some unharmonicity. On the left uh, side, you see here, I have introduced a negative kernel linearity, which makes the energy level softer and softer as we uh, have more and more photons. And the energy uh, separation between the ground and the excited state is different between the first and second excited state. So if I inject a microwave with precisely this frequency for a sufficiently long pulse, I can excite uh, precisely the, the state that was here in zero to one or one to zero and vice versa and create any superposition of those states. And the probability that the system leaks to higher energy states can be arbitrarily small depending on the length of my pulses and the strength of the unharmonicity that I have introduced. 
And that's a theoretical uh, view of how, what we have to do. But the nice thing is that the experimentalists know how to do this. So they, they know how to create these unharmonic oscillators. Essentially, what you have to do is you have to replace the inductor that we have in the LC circuit. And instead of that, you have to put a nonlinear inductor. So you have to put uh, just a conjunction that changes <coughs> the, the, the magnetic energy associated to this resonator. Uh, here, up here, you see a one qubit. It's called a transmon qubit. It's just a name people give them uh, with a capacitor. And here in the middle, you see that you have two Josephson junctions that connect these two plates of the capacitor. It would be essentially the connection that you see here. The circuit can be manipulated by external sources, and, and I will show you later that it can also be measured. A nice thing about this transmon, this qubit, uh, which is now our artificial atom, which has many levels, but we can constrain ourselves to these two, for instance, is that this typically can be a tunable atom. So I can change the properties of this atom, I can change its energy gaps, in the harmonicity, by changing the, the how deep or how uh, tight this potential is. And I do this with this uh, loop that you see here. Instead of having one junction, I have two. And if some magnetic field passes through here, the effective inductance of this line changes. So I can really tune the nonlinear inductance of my artificial atom, and I can change the frequencies of this uh, atom to bring in in other resonance with uh, our microwave source, with other uh, atoms, or with uh, some resonators. So we have really uh, a very flexible system in our hands. We have, uh, I show you the plasma qubit. We have also many other qubits. We have the Charles qubit, like I said, so coconut island, as you see here. We have flux qubits that have loops uh, where you have a, a, a currents in the ground state and these currents interact with the magnetic field uh, instead of uh, interacting with the electrostatic field that these uh, qubits prefer. And you have a, a huge zoo of, of qubits with different properties depending on what are the energy scales and harmonicities, what they like to interact with, how we manipulate them, and so on and so forth. So it's a broad literature of qubits and it's still uh, ongoing research on how to make these qubits better and better because right now they are kind of the bottleneck of uh, all the science that we have. But once we have light and once we have qubits, we really have the possibility of doing what people call CQQD, CQ quantum electrodynamics, which is essentially a, a fancy name for quantum optics with circuits. Uh, so now I'm going to simply uh, illustrate the simplest quantum phenomenon that you can do with a qubit, which is to produce a photon. If you have an excited system and you let it relax, your excited atom is going to release some energy in a quantum of energy, which is a photon that propagates and goes away. And, and that's a very fundamental uh, physical process that we understand very well for nature, for physical systems overall. And it's a, the underlying phenomenon of many things, like for instance, the lacing and so on. Uh, and in circuits, we can do that. It's, it's essentially a very simple way to prove that we have really quantized uh, electromagnetic fields. We simply have to replace this theoretician's view of the world with the elements I showed you before. We need a cable for, or a tube to, to confine and propagate the, the microwaves. We need some source to excite a, a qubit, and the qubit has to be put inside this, uh, this microwave uh, tube. And, and you have to realize that this is really a microscopic picture. This, this guy is a few centimeters large, and this is a few millimeters large. So really, we are, doing, we are exploring quantum mechanics at a microscopic level. But we, experimentalists have built this circuit, and actually this is a picture from uh, the group of Gerhard Kichmeier in Innsbruck. And uh, what they have done is they have uh, explored this single photon generation. The, the other uh, ingredient that we have to bring into the pictures now are measurements. Unfortunately, microwave photons have very little energy. That means that we cannot bring, we cannot, we don't have uh, microwave photo detectors, uh, good microwave photo detectors so far. Instead, we have to use some kind of electronics to uh, explore the wave function and the electromagnetic fields that go together with this photon. What you, I show here is some uh, schematics of how we do these measurements. And essentially, we have to first amplify the field, and then we have to pass this field through a nonlinear circuit that brings the frequencies down and, and splits it in the two quadratures of the electromagnetic field, the real and imaginary part of the electromagnetic field. They pass through a, a digitizing uh, device that measures the voltage associated to each of these two quadratures, and it produces some some signal that we can uh, interpret in, in a computer. So it's, it's very different from ordinary optics in the sense that we really have to look at the electromagnetic field as it moves uh, uh, in time. Of course, you have to remember that quantum measurements are uh, 
probabilistic. So if you do a single run of an experiment, it's going to be noisy. So you, you get something that looks like scrambled. But from that uh, noise, you, uh, I can tell you that you can infer a lot of information, like for instance, a Wigner function and other properties of the photons uh, or, or the states of light that are propagating through the waveguide. And that's a, a technique that was pioneered by different groups, for instance, the WMI in Garching, uh, and, and also the, the ATH uh, group of Andreas Barra in, uh, in Zurich. And they took this, uh, this idea of looking at the, the electromagnetic field that goes with the photon and, and making different ways of, of probing it. I'm going to show you what happens in the lab in, in the group of Gerhard Kirchmeier with a particular experiment. So what they did is they first uh, sent a microwave uh, pulse, well, a very long pulse, uh, that drives this qubit. And this is what you see at the other side of the wave, right? Once it has passed through the qubit, the, the electromagnetic field has gone through the qubit, and you see the, the, the laser light, or so-called so, so laser light, uh, which casts a little bit of the original field plus the light that has been re-emitted by the, the atom. Here we cannot see much, we simply see uh, a kind of coherent field with the oscillations that have been brought to a lower uh, frequency thanks to this nonlinear mixing process. What is important is that this very strong and nonlinear drive is prepares the qubit in a kind of a superposition. It's a mixture of uh, quantum superposition between ground and excited state. So if I stop now this drive, what happens is that the qubit is going to relax and it's going to emit energy. Essentially, we're going to see something like this. Again, these pictures appear after a lot of averaging. Otherwise, we would see simply noise. But you see that something happens at this point where I stop driving the qubit. And what happens is a mixture of two processes. First, because we had an amplifier, the amplifier has, has some residual energy that it releases in form of a microwave. That's at the beginning, something that you see here. But once the energy has been released, all what, that we are seeing is the photon that is created by the relaxation of the supergrafting qubit that we, we see here. So that's a very nice uh, picture to see as a physicist. We're really seeing uh, physically the wave packet of a spontaneously emitted photon after we drive this qubit. So essentially, the, this will be the exponential envelope of the emitted photon. And this is what I told you before. So the, the possibility of using these circuits brings us new ways of measuring and also new possibilities because uh, if you try to do these experiments with atoms, that will require a very, very fast physics by going that down to atom physics to see uh, a wave packet of a photon. Here we can do it with ordinary electronics. So we can think about experiments that we can do with this possibility. And one, and one idea that the, the group in, in Innsbruck had was to really try to look at the whole wave function of the avoid photon. You can change the, the central frequency of the amplifier and you can look at the, at the photon as it is created in time and also in frequency uh, through this uh, really quantum physical process. And this is uh, the theoretical prediction of the emission of the photon, and this is the real physical picture that we see in the lab. And you notice that initially the photon is spread over all possible frequencies as, uh, and within a time, which is essentially the spontaneous emission time, the time for the atom to decay, uh, the frequency concentrates around the resonance of the artificial atom that we have here. And this is essentially a visualization of the uh, Heisenberg energy time uncertainty relation, which is very nice to see again as a quantum physicist. So I'm going very fast, sorry, but I want to expose you to a lot of ideas that we, we need to, to make this technology useful. I have shown you here the possibilities of studying how atoms interact with waveguides and we deposit energy with, on the waveguide and, and you can probe and manipulate the atom with this microwave. It's essentially a, a, an illustration of a broader phenomenon, which is called strong coupling. Essentially, we take our qubits and we place them in, in waveguides and these qubits interact very strongly with the light. Uh, for instance, you can put a qubit in a resonator, and this was the seminal experiment that can, kind of started the field of uh, CQQD by the group of J. They put a qubit in a resonator, and they changed the frequency of the qubit, and when the qubit came in resonance with the resonator, they saw this uh, uh, spectral uh, splitting of the uh, resonator resonance, which is essentially an evidence that you have a very strong interaction between the microwave photons and the qubit, and the eigenstates of the problem are actually entangled states of, of the qubit and, and, and photon and so on and so forth. And just, so it's a way to, to uh, probe the James Camis model that we know from quantum optics. So what, essentially what happens in, is that uh, I told you that supercatic circuits are very good simulators. They, they copycat uh, many physical phenomena in nature. And in particular, we're using the same sequence, the same materials to, to simulate photons and to simulate matter. Uh, and because it's the same material, the kind of photons and the kind of atoms that we build together 
they have a very good impedance match. It's not like a, a real photon talking to an ordinary atom. They are very different objects, and, and the, the, the coupling strength between them is not very good in free space. Here, in these low-dimensional artificial environments where uh, light and matter is made of the same material, we can achieve very, very large coupling strength between light and matter, and this allows for a very fast operation of these devices. For instance, uh, in, very early in 2010, in the group in Munich showed that you could take a qubit and you could couple to a microwave photon, and the interaction strength between the, the qubit and the photon could be 14% the photon frequency. Since then, in Japan, people have achieved to go over 100% the, the photon energy. So the, the interaction energy between the photon and the qubit can be as large as the energy that the photon carries itself. So that's a, a broad uh, range of possibilities for exploring new physics. But what people have been concentrating on right now is really in doing uh, quantum technology applications, and in particular, in doing quantum computers. So that's where we reach uh, uh, the kind of uh, it's a very uh, long-term milestones of building scalable uh, superconducting quantum computers. And I'm going to illustrate you a little bit how all the ingredients I mentioned before, they get together to, to build this kind of devices. It's uh, not too easy to, to, not too difficult to understand, sorry, it's very easy to understand. And I have chosen a particular setup uh, from the Martinez group when they were in Santa Barbara University, which is this very visual, very nice uh, to interpret the uh, picture of a, uh, uh, it's a nine qubit quantum computer. Okay, so what well, that would be? What's the recipe for building a quantum computer? So the first thing that you need is qubits. And I've shown you that there are many qubits. People mostly nowadays are using Trasman qubits because they are very good qubits. They have uh, very good coherence properties and they are very reproducible. You can design a Trasman, and, and they come out with very few percent errors in the frequencies that you design them. And you can also tune their frequencies uh, as, as I showed you before. So in this particular uh, device, you have uh, nine qubits uh, arranged in a one-dimensional uh, setup. And the qubits can see each other, the nearest neighbor, uh, coupling, and there are other devices around them. So the other thing I mentioned before is that uh, we need to, uh, we, we have a very strong uh, coupling between the qubits and, and these waveguides. And essentially this is made possible because the, 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 the qubits and the waveguides, they are surrounded. So we can uh, isolate a little bit these this, uh, devices from the environment by making large ground planes that are at constant voltage and that are going to protect these devices from uh, uh, external perturbations. And now we need to manipulate the qubits, so we uh, build uh, resonators. Uh, these resonators are simply these microwave coaxial waveguides that I showed you before. And a nice trick that experimentalists play is that they don't make all the waveguides identical, they, they have a slightly different frequencies. So that means that each, uh, each uh, resonator is going to have a fundamental mode that's slightly different from the previous, the nearest one. And because we can bring the qubits uh, to different frequencies by tuning them with a, a squeeze, I showed you before, we can make them interact with uh, its own qubit very efficiently. But the most important thing is that this, uh, this kind of technology allows us to do individual addressing. So I can connect this to a, a microwave generator and by choosing the frequency of the microgenerator, I can choose which qubit I want to manipulate. I show you in this, in this kind of sketch that I can send a, a microwave signal. I don't know if it comes. Uh, and it's going to be precisely to the resonator that has the right frequency. And if we bring the qubit in resonance with this resonator, we can give the qubit enough energy to experience the transformation. Essentially, we can change the wave function of the qubit. Uh, it's, it's now known that uh, by this kind of uh, microwave drives, we can really do any uh, a unitary transformation in the Hilbert space of this two-level system, the qubit, all possible rotations, Hadamard rotations, free rotation, whatever unitary you can think in the block sphere can be done with this mic by controlling the intensity and the phase of these microwaves. So the first uh, ingredient is our quantum register and the possibility of writing uh, information and doing single operations into these uh, qubits. But that's a little bit uh, useless if we don't have a way to measure those qubits. How to do that is a little bit more subtle. Uh, we need to understand that uh, qubits perturb the environment. So take this resonator. The resonator, as I told you, is this kind of LC mode. It's, a, it's an oscillator with a central frequency. It has some kind of uh, resonance. If I, if I drive this resonator and I send energy to it in the form of a microwave uh, field, it's going to be reflected with a phase shift relative to the original signal. If I put a qubit now in contact with this resonator, I can expect that this uh, process is going to change. So if I put a qubit 
uh, near to the resonator and it's in a zero state, it, it can shift the resonance and uh, frequency of the resonator to a different value. And what happens is that if I drive with the same frequency as before, now the, uh, the phase shift is going to be different. Moreover, if I have the qubit in the one state, energy shift has to happen in the other direction, so the phase shift even goes further away in the opposite direction as, as before. So by looking at how uh, the reflective microwaves look like and comparing with the microwaves I am injecting, I can do a very precise measurement of the qubits that are with each resonator. And because each resonator has a different frequency, I can in principle measure all these qubits simultaneously, depending on how I can discriminate those signals and, and amplify them. For instance, if I prepare a qubit in the ground state at zero temperature and I send a microwave signal and I look at a particular value of the phase, I, I know that it's in the ground state. Or, or I can excite the qubit and, and look at the, the phase shift that's going to be in the opposite side of the, of, the, of the scale. And I know that I have a perfectly one qubit. And I can, of course, drive the qubit in create a superposition and afterwards measure. And then what happens is, of course, the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics kicks in and I'm going to get uh, different uh, phase shifts depending on uh, with the statistics that depends on the superposition I have created here. So essentially, this is the way that people are doing measurements in quantum computers nowadays. And if you are familiar with uh, working with Qiskit and other quantum environments, that's, that's what we are doing uh, in those devices. But now comes the more important ingredient because so far we have individual qubits. I can write states in those qubits uh, independently, but I can only create product states. In order to have a real quantum computer, I need some way to engineer entanglement. I need uh, what is called a universal two qubit operation. Fortunately, in this case, uh, this is provided by a very simple uh, element, which is the nearest neighbor interaction between qubits that are placed close together. So you have one qubit and it's close to another qubit. There's going to be a small but important capacitive interaction between these two qubits. And this interaction allows them to ex exchange excitation. So the, essentially what happens is I, I can prepare uh, a qubit in a one state, another qubit in a zero state. And if I bring the qubits to the right frequency so that they can interact uh, uh, almost resonantly, they could exchange excitation. Essentially, I would start somehow here and I can go to different, uh, so this qubit, uh, the one on the left will be excited. And after a period of time, it will be de-excited, uh, pass uh, the energy to the other qubit, and, and so on and so forth. And, and somehow in the middle, here, places like this, what I have is I'm creating entangled states. And by processes like this, by choosing exactly uh, how long I leave the qubits to interact with each other, I can create uh, unitaries that uh, are two qubit unitaries because they only act on the nearest uh, uh, qubits. And I combine them with uh, local unitaries and with measurements, and I have a really a uh, universal model for quantum computation. So that's uh, in a nutshell uh, how we go from uh, superconductors to quantum computers. Essentially, that would be the last ingredient. And there are many things, again, uh, here that uh, I'm not going to talk about. For instance, how can I make simultaneously a gate here or also between these two qubits? Or how can I avoid that this qubit does not perturb the gate I make here? Uh, what are the limiting factors for the operation of these qubits? How many qubits I can print in a chip? Because this seems like a one-dimensional structure, probably not very useful. How can I go to two-dimensional structures? How can, how can I do this really scalable? And that's a lot of research that is going on by now, and that's uh, very interesting and very important. So what are the avenues to improve these technologies? Well, there are different possibilities. Uh, in, in our group, we are participating right now in two European initiatives. There is a big project in uh, Europe, which is called Open SuperQ, which aims at constructing a, a superconducting-based uh, quantum computer, similar to the ones in Spirit, to the ones that IBM or Google have already built. Uh, we want to explore different uh, possibilities. I'm going to briefly present these two lines of research that are still uh, that we will, we will launch after the summer uh, as, uh, in two different consortiums. So one possibility, for instance, would be to uh, think about what we can do when we take two quantum computers and we connect them together. How do you connect two quantum computers? Well, in, in this case where we have superconductors, we will simply have to have some coaxial cable that allows microwaves to propagate from one computer to another, kind of what you see here. In reality, of course, because these cables are going to transport uh, quantum information, you really need to be cable also very cold. 
And this is what you see here in this setup uh, in the group of Andreas Balraff in Zurich, where they have two fridges connected by a five meter tube and another fridge. And this is at very low temperatures, and they have demonstrated the transfer of information between these uh, two cryostats. So what we want to explore now is what you can do with this possibility, how you can have two computers and you can distribute computations among them, or you can use one computer and one uh, kind of memory device, or how we can think about scaling this up to more devices, or even how we can take like uh, clusters of computers and try to connect these to other computers by means of uh, transducers. So devices that take the information that is now in microwave form and brings it up in energy to the optical domain, where we can make a longer link to a computer that can be in a different room or even in a different point of the city. So these are new possibilities that are exploring a little bit of the, the, the edge of uh, what we can do with, with quantum computers. But there is another, I like it very much, it's a, a different avenue of work, which is really quantum simulation. So I told you before that uh, superconductors are quantum computers, are, sim are quantum simulators, and I have shown you how they can simulate really quantum optics, and that's how we build quantum computers. But they can also simulate many other systems. For instance, they can simulate condensed matter systems. Uh, if you think about this kind of toy models for condensed matter physics, we have some of them that are like uh, conceptually simple, like uh, spin models. We have like uh, spin one half particles interacting with each other through Heisenberg, IC models, and so on. And they are uh, fundamental paradigms in, in condensed matter physics. And some of those uh, paradigms we know that can be already implemented using superconducting qubits. For instance, uh, the company D-Way have shown how to use flash qubits, the superconductor loops I showed you before, to implement like effective uh, spins and how these spins interact uh, with each other via IC interactions. This is a, a kind of first proof uh, principle where they, can, they have reached uh, thousands of qubits. What we want to do is we want to take the next generations of uh, flash qubits, improve the coherence of these qubits, and also explore models that are not just uh, IC models, but could be other more interesting models, like SY, Heisenberg models, and different kinds of interactions, different topologies, and different properties. This is a different project called Abacus, and also online right now, and it will launch after the, after the summer. So it's been, uh, I think I'm still in time. So I would like to close the talk by thanking our group. This is uh, an old picture. We are going to grow a little bit uh, after the summer with you know, people coming in to work on these topics. But essentially, our group is working in, in two lines of research. One is uh, what we call quantum hardware. We are looking at different platforms, like superconducting circuit, uh, trapped ions, coal atoms, uh, photonics, and photonics, to build quantum technologies, not only quantum computers, but also quantum sensors or machine learning devices, and so on. And the other line of research is, of course, uh, application of quantum computers by developing algorithms and different kind of protocols that make useful things with the devices that we have nowadays. Uh, uh, Roberto told you that we are uh, working in the Spanish Research Council. It's kind of, uh, I, say, I like to say it's like a mass plan, but without the money. So it's an it's a institution that covers all possible, inst lots of institutes all across Spain, 120 institutes, of which 20 something are in physics, and we are really in the center of, of Madrid and in a very nice location. And once all these things with the pandemia and so on are sorted out, we are really welcome to visit us and interact with us in, in Madrid. And that's all for, for my side.